The title of this lecture is What Does Iron Do to the Blood? This is iron overload lecture number three. So here's a blood draw, and we can see that the blood has been centrifuged and the red blood cells sediment to the bottom. That tells you the hematocrit. It's about 44%. Um, the white blood cells are in the center here, the buffy coat, plasma above, translucent. And this is normal blood. If the person's eating a high-fat meal, then the plasma will be full of fat, like the chylomicrons, and it'll be rather opaque. Okay, so what's happening in the blood? Normally, red blood cells have a negative charge all around their outer surface called the zeta potential. The negative charge is produced by these sialic acids, which are very much like a molecule of glucose with a carboxylic acid on it. In addition to the sialic acids, you'll also have cholesterol sulfates, which add to the negative charge on the outer surface of the red blood cells. Molecules that are able to overcome the zeta potential and stick the red blood cells together have to be big enough in size and have a positive charge on their outer surface. So IgM antibodies will do that, LDL cholesterol will do that, fibrinogen will do that, the major clotting protein, and uric acid will do that. Okay, um, red blood cell typically is about 7 microns in diameter. It's, a, it's called a discoid shape. It's narrower in the center. Um, Typical capillary is a little smaller, about 5 microns, so it has to fold back on itself a little bit to go through that capillary. If you eat a high-fat meal, you're going to have increased LDL cholesterol plus the chylomicrons. They cause the red blood cells to sludge together, and this has been called the rouleau formation, a stack of red blood cells, and that means a stack of coins in French. Um, and when they're all stuck together, it's harder to push them through that capillary, so blood pressure goes up. Increased thickness of the blood is called increased viscosity of the blood. The higher the LDL cholesterol, the higher the blood viscosity. The thicker the blood, the higher the blood pressure is going to tend to be. The higher the hematocrit, again, the higher the blood viscosity, the higher the blood pressure is going to tend to be. Things that increase blood pressure increase risk of atherosclerosis. The bicycle racers, you know, like Lance Armstrong and the other guys uh, from all over the world, they would sometimes take epoetin, which is the hormone made by the kidneys, to increase red blood cells. And while increased red blood cells would give them more energy when they're in the Tour de France going up a big hill in a six-hour race, it would also, while they're just sitting around laying around, increase the risk of clotting. And a significant number of these bicycle riders had you know, clots in the arteries of their heart, and they died despite being young and super fit. So you don't want your hematocrit up over 50 like these guys had. Normal hematocrit, you know, let's say it's, you know, lower, you know, significantly lower than 50. Let's say 44 or something like that would be a reasonable hematocrit. Um, or 40. Okay, anyways, here's red blood cells sticking together. That's abnormal. Up here, they're more independent, running normal, forming clumps after a high-fat meal. Dr. McDougall has a good video at his YouTube uh, channel, uh, Dr. McDougall Health Center. And you can, he'll show you normal red blood cells traveling nicely um, under routine conditions. And then after eating a high-fat meal, they're all stuck together in the clumps. And this comes from work uh, also done by Roy Swank. And they would look in hamsters' cheek pouches. But now they've been able to do this looking in the eyes. Uh, Meyer Friedman, Ray Rosenman did that in humans with an 80 times microscope. And they've been looking under the tongue now, sublingual, other researchers. So it's pretty well established. And it's known especially to happen with, you know, saturated fat and also with um, cooking oils like omega-6 fats, for example, especially. Um, peripheral smear. So here we got normal hematocrit, you know, about 42, a little higher than that as well. Normal hemoglobin. Typically hemoglobin is about one-third of what the hematocrit is. Um, When you look at a peripheral smear of the red blood cells, you can see that they're the vast majority of cells. They're over 99% of the blood and under normal circumstances is going to be red blood cells. Typical lymphocyte nucleus is about the size of RBCs. This nucleus is actually bigger than usual for a lymphocyte. It's just something to guide you on the size of the red blood cells. This is a neutrophil, also called a polymorphonuclear leukocyte. Uh, RBCs have a discoid shape but a central pallor. So here might be a normal red blood cell with iron deficiency anemia. They're a little smaller in size. That's called microcytic and hypochromic, less hemoglobin in them. So you get a bigger central uh, pallor, central, central bare area. B 
B12 deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency can lead to macrocytic anemia where they're bigger in size. Um, when you have excess iron, it can cause distortion of the shape. Acanthocyte, I remember A for acanthocyte, A for asymmetric shape. It'll have some spurs on it, but they're not uniform in their distribution. When you have uh, iron, you can also get an echinocyte. And I remember E for echinocyte, E for equidistant spurs all around it, whereas A for acanthocyte is asymmetric distribution of the spurs. Okay, excess iron can also cause other deformities of red blood cells, make them teardrop shape uh, or some of these other shapes. Okay, I've talked about this before. We're just going to briefly mention that a high-fat meal is going to cause the neutrophils to release myeloperoxidase, which has a positive charge on it, and it interacts with the red blood cells, outer plasma membrane, and it can cause distortion of shape in RBCs like acanthocytes, asymmetric spurring, echinocytes, equidistant, E for equidistant spurring. That also a echino is kind of like a, an echinid. It's, it's like a porcupine having uh, spurs all over itself. So what I'm getting at here is there's multiple things happening simultaneously to deform these red blood cells. you got the potential for excess iron. You've got the uh, neutrophils being activated and causing distortion because of the myeloperoxidase. And here's the articles. Here's all the papers on that for anybody who's interested. The high fat meal also cause increased externalization of phosphatidylserine. So phosphatidylserine normally in a younger RBC is predominantly in the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane on the outer surface of the red blood cell. And then it'll flip flop to the outer leaflet. When this occurs, you can see here's the, the legend for phosphatidylserine, the PS is for phosphatidylserine. When it flips to the outer layer, the red blood cell becomes more stiff, less able to deform itself to pass through the capillary basement membranes. And that, that causes blood pressure to go up because you're pumping a bigger thing. So it's gonna have to go up to get the adequate pressure to push it through the capillary. Um, it also becomes more prothrombotic, has more of a tendency to aggregate with other red blood cells, more of a tendency to bind to the endothelium. So this is all bad. You don't want your blood clotting unless there's a, you know, arterial wall injury. So this stuff is not good for your health. Also, this activation of neutrophils, this is just showing the myeloperoxidase causes reactions that transform the superoxide into, like, hypochlorous acid, and, you know, that's a partly how it has the ability to damage infectious cells. But one of the problems is this myeloperoxidase in particular has got a lot of positive charge associated with it, and so it'll interact with a negative charge of the glycocalyx. EG is for endothelial cell glycocalyx, and it causes the endothelial glycocalyx to collapse down. The glycocalyx is like a bunch of trees on a hill sticking up from the plasma membrane of the endothelium. And when it collapses down, then the neutrophil can bind to the receptors on the wall. All of this is causing more inflammation. All of it is causing more of a tendency for the blood to clot. You don't want a blood clot. That's why people die. Blood clots in the heart is a heart attack, myocardial infarction. Blood clots in the brain is a stroke. And so what I'm saying is high fat meal makes this worse. So does eating iron, so does leaky gut. This is just additional pictures showing the collapse of the glycocalyx, due to the myeloperoxidase, the binding of the neutrophils, and sort of progression and worsening of this inflammatory phase, prothrombotic phase. Okay, let me just go right to the, the good stuff. When you have leaky gut, and again, meat has no fiber in it, and processed food has very little fiber, so they increase the likelihood of leaky gut, because you need fiber to maintain the tight junctions between the lining cells of the gut wall, the enterocytes, because the gut's called the enteric tract. When you have leaky gut, you get gram-negative endotoxins from gram-negative bacteria, LPS, lipopolysaccharide, gram-positive bacteria producing lipotychoic acid, and they're able to get across the leaky gut. And leaky gut means increased intestinal permeability, and then they get into the blood, and they have a prothrombotic effect. Um, free iron, when it is present due to excessive chronic iron overload, for example, also will have a prothrombotic effect. And one of those major prothrombotic effects is the distortion of the structure of the fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is a precursor blood clotting protein. It normally has hydrogen bonds within itself, connecting different parts of itself. So those are intra, intra, meaning inside, intra, intramolecular hydrogen bonds. And they will distort it so the hydrogen bonds will form between adjacent molecules. So then you get all these adjacent molecules and they're going to stack up on themselves. 
So this is a, what's called the alpha helix secondary configuration, and this is what is called a beta pleated sheet secondary configuration. And the beta pleated sheets are flat, so they can all stack up together, and you get these big, first it's an oligomer of these fibrinogen molecules, and then later on it can polymerase and become even uh, more of them all stuck together. And it creates an abnormal appearance of the blood clots. They call them dense matted deposits, and they're more difficult to lyse. They're bad. They're more at risk for occluding an uh, important artery. Um, the free iron will also cause some activation of dormant bacteria in the blood, and those can release LPS or LTA. And by the way, these are the two that figured out most of this stuff. Estheresia Pretorius, she's based in South Africa, PhD. Douglas Kell, PhD, he's a guy based out of England. Okay, so they have some internet videos if you're curious about them. But this was pretty brilliant work. And this is just more of the same thing. Normal red blood cell with normal clotting proteins around it, like pieces of spaghetti. Distorted shape in the presence of excess free iron, presumably due to oxidative stress. And here's a distorted red blood cell stuck in one of these dense matted deposits. Abnormally thick clot where it no longer looks like spaghetti. And that's due to, like we just talked about, the amyloidogenic effect of excess iron and of bacterial endotoxins. So that's an example of what iron can do to the blood. Um, just a little bit more, a few more slides here. One thing worth knowing is you want to know what's a normal serum ferritin level because that's going to be your target for when you donate blood. And you want it somewhere between 20 or 30 to 80. This is especially based on the research of this guy, Dr. Leo Zacharski, and he did a lot of good work, put a lot of time into figuring that out. People ask me about iron deficiency anemia, and I'm really not focusing on iron deficiency anemia, but just be aware of it. That's more especially a problem for young women when they go into puberty because they're simultaneously increasing their growth rate, needing more iron while they begin to menstruate, and they're losing iron. For our ancestors many years ago, it might have been harder to get adequate iron. A lot of them were kind of half starving. It's also been called the love sickness disease of virgins because that's, you know, the first going into puberty, young girls, they're the ones who it happens to. So it, it got that name. All right, so be careful with iron deficiency anemia. All these experts I was reading, I read a bunch of books on biochemistry of iron, and they, they felt that it's way over-treated. If the woman is healthy and vigorous um, and asymptomatic, you know, then regardless of the threshold, maybe she's actually doing pretty well. So these are just some parameters you'll sometimes see on the labs. You know, is there serum ferritin really low? Is there transfer and saturation less than 16? So that's sort of a special subset. And anyways, that is all we've got for what does iron do to the blood? And this has been iron overload. Actually, this was part three we just completed.